Okay. So um, we read the passage from Daniel 9. Um, we'll just continue to look at what is it talking about. Okay, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. So here we see um, a period of 70 sets of seven or uh, 70 sevens, right? Uh, that is used here. And um, that can mean either 70 weeks, right? Uh, that's how we would normally understand it, 70 sevens, uh, 70 weeks. Uh, but uh, because this is uh, prophetic, uh, language, um, we will look at what does that 77s mean? Because if we're looking at it as 70 weeks, that means it's just over a year, 52 weeks in a year, plus uh, another 18 weeks or so. Uh, for Daniel's uh, prophecy to be fulfilled, which is about uh, the uh, city of Jerusalem uh, being rebellious about people sinning and then about uh, the coming of the anointed one right so verse 25 it says the uh, from the time the command is given to rebuild jerusalem until a ruler the anointed one comes uh, and here we see that there is 70 sevens uh, seven sevens plus 62 sevens uh, in verse 25 will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Um, <clears throat> so in, uh, in scripture, this uh, period of one week uh, is sometimes understood as a year. Uh, there, uh, there are different ways in which this is understood. Uh, one way is based on Ezekiel 4, 4 to 6. Uh, so if we look at Ezekiel 4, 4 to 6, um, I'll just uh, read that for us. So it says, now lie on your left side and place the sins of Israel on yourself. You are to bear their sins for the number of days you lie there on your side. I am requiring you to bear Israel's sins for 390 days, one day for each year of their sin. Uh, after that, turn over and lie on your right side for 40 days, one day for each year of Judah's sin. Uh, so here is where we see one day used to refer to one year. Uh, so when we see uh, 77s, uh, the sevens or seven weeks uh, we understand as seven years. Uh, this is one way that it's interpreted as seven years, but another way is just based on the Hebrew word. Um, so the Hebrew word is Shabua, and that can be either translated as seven days or seven years, or it can be translated as a week. Okay, so because seven days would be a week, or it can be translated as seven years. So why do we take this uh, 77s? Why do we take that sevens as seven years rather than uh, days or rather than a week? Um, is because uh, if we look at the fulfillment of that prophecy as well, and we uh, calculate uh, what he was referring to, what Daniel was referring to, we can see that that prophecy was actually fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. Uh, so we base that calculation uh, on the approximate dates that are given for the different events that happened uh, that are mentioned in Daniel um, chapter 9. So we'll just go back to Daniel 9. Okay, so um, it talks about, it starts with the period of 70, uh, 77s uh, for this rebellion to be put to end uh, till the most holy place is anointed. Uh, verse 25, it says seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven. So that is 69 right 69 weeks um and 69 uh, weeks uh if we took that uh if we calculated it 
uh, the way we uh, talked about, where one week equals a year, it would be 483 years. Uh, now, if we look at what all is talked about in this verse 25, it says, uh, these 483 years or these 69 uh, weeks will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem. So the command that was given to rebuild Jerusalem was given by King Artaxerxes in uh, Ezra 7. He gives Ezra permission to go back and rebuild the city. Uh, now those dates, uh, these are all approximate dates, uh, but the date that is usually looked at is about 457 BC, uh, when King Artaxerxes gives that command to rebuild the city. Uh, and then uh, there were 49 years when the city was actually rebuilt. So 457 to 408 BC is when the city was rebuilt. And then 434 years later was when Jesus was baptized and he started his ministry. That's AD 27. Uh, and it says here, until a ruler, the anointed one comes. Okay, so that is the prediction that from the time of the giving of the command for Jerusalem to be rebuilt till the time the anointed one comes, there will be these 69 weeks or 483 years. Uh, and if we look at that 457 BC from when King Artaxerxes gave that command or gave Ezra permission to Jesus's baptism and the coming and starting of his ministry, which is AD 27, that is a period of 483 years. Now, uh, this calculation is based on historians' approximate dating of all these events. But it's um, very, very close to what Daniel has said here, right? So it's actually the exact same, 483 years. Uh, so based on this, we know that our interpretation of one week uh, e being equal to seven years is correct. Okay, uh, so here we have the privilege of having the fulfillment already, and we can look back and see. Um, whereas in with some prophecies, we still are waiting for their fulfillment. But uh, this is how we look at interpretation. So uh, we looked at how do we understand this seven. Uh, Seven seventy sevens, right? How do we understand that? We can understand it based on how uh, Ezekiel 4, 4 to 6 uses it. One day equals one year. Or we can understand based on just that Hebrew word that's used, which can be translated either as a week or a year. And uh, if we take it as a year, we see that actually this prophecy has already, I mean, if we calculate it back, we can see that what Daniel prophesied exactly took place with Jesus' coming. OK, uh, so uh, with time, this is uh, something that we need to recognize, that sometimes there is this figurative language, language, sometimes there's literal language. And when we have figurative language, uh, we need to look at how does the rest of scripture has is there any examples in the rest of scripture that we can use to help us understand what that figurative language is talking about um is that does that make sense the uh interpretation of timing and this use of figurative versus literal it's a little confusing Okay. So this uh, prophecy already fulfilled, right? Yes, the the prophecy. Uh, uh, do we have to learn about this prophecy now? So, uh, do we have to learn about it? Is that your question? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, sister. So we're just using this as an example of how uh, time can be used figuratively. So it's saying here seventy sevens or seventy weeks but uh or 77 weeks but what it's actually meaning is 70 into 7 so that's 490 years so 
if we're taking it literally, then we're only looking at 70 weeks. But if we take it as uh, how Daniel was talking about it, then we understand that it's 490 years. And we know that Jesus came after the 483 years. Now, the remaining seven years are yet to be fulfilled. And that is something that will come uh, at a later period of time. So if we read, uh, we continue to read in this uh, chapter in Daniel 9, there is a break after the coming of the anointed one. There are certain things that will happen. And then these last seven years will be fulfilled. Uh, so that is yet to happen. OK, sister, thank you. It was a little confusing for me. <laughs> yes. So uh, anything you want me to go over again, specifically in that? OK, uh, what I'll do is I'll just post those references on the chat. Um, and that will hopefully help you um, help you kind of have a better idea of uh, what I explained. Yeah, you can. Uh, yes, thank you, sister. Yes, you can go through the video. Uh, I'll also just post on chat what I I uh, had shared uh, the different references, so you also have that with you. OK, OK, sister. Thank you. No problem. OK, so this is just uh, rough notes. If you all have any questions, uh, post reading it after class or anything, you can. Uh, you can let me know. OK, so uh, with that, we actually um, come to just some final um, thoughts on how do we interpret uh, prophecy. So these were three main things that we looked at was the timeline. Uh, the second was uh, the use of figurative language or imagery. And the third was uh, time itself being talked about figuratively. Um, so some principles that we can follow. Uh, one is um, to still take into consideration, as we do with all interpretation of scripture, to take the historical context, the grammatical meaning of the words, uh, and to also first look at literally interpreting the passage. We will only consider it as figurative language if the literal meaning seems to be something that doesn't make any sense or something that is impossible. Uh, if it's something like that, like the language of the beast, uh, dragon, all of those things, where we know that this is not uh, not meant to be taken literally, then we start to do this process of interpreting. What does it mean? What do these pictures mean? Um, otherwise, we will always try and take it literally. We'll try and take it to mean what it says, right? We'll just try to take the meaning of the words and we'll try to take the historical context into consideration as well. Um, so uh, we also need to remember that a lot of the revelation is talking about future events and it's usually pointing to Jesus's uh, reign that is coming on earth. So when we understand that, we uh, can look at the prophecy and see, OK, how how is this pointing to Jesus's coming? What is it saying about Jesus's coming? So we have uh, that as a guideline for when we are interpreting that it's not something that is completely new that we don't know anything about. Uh, we already know a lot about what is prophesied or, or what scripture says about Jesus's return. And so the interpretation should be in line with that. Um, we also uh, recognize that uh, this example is given 1 Peter 1, 10, 3, 11. Um, this principle of foreshortening. 
So what that means is that when prophets uh, wrote in scripture, they didn't always know exactly the timeline of what they themselves were talking about. Right, so that this is why we see those that mixture in timelines, something coming before something else, or a huge gap between something that is mentioned in uh, a sing a single verse. Right, so they have a revelation. They have uh, they are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they write down what they're inspired to write. But at the same time, they didn't have the full picture. They have a part of the picture, and that's what they've written about. So uh, this is why it becomes important to uh, look at other parts of scripture as well and take all of that into consideration as we are interpreting prophetic uh, passages uh, so that we don't expect things to happen exactly as one passage has talked about but we are able to look at everything and we look at a few examples here also uh, and then understand what is the, the bigger picture uh, of this prophecy. Um, we also will look for built-in interpretations. So uh, in uh, Daniel 2 is an example of uh, where Daniel himself interprets uh, uh, interprets a dream, right? So we have the dream, we have, uh, and we have the interpretation as well. So uh, in some passages, we'll have that uh, provided for us already, the interpretation provided already. And so that will help us know, okay, this is the meaning of what we're reading. Um, and then the next point is what I was just mentioning to us. So we look at parallel passages in scripture. So if we're looking at Revelation 13, we'll also look at Daniel 9, what we were just reading about. Okay, so if we're looking at Joel 2, 18 to 32, so Joel 2 um, talks about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also look at that in uh, relation to Revelation 19. Okay, so Revelation 19 is talking about the millennial reign of Christ. So Joel 2 talks about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and then goes into the millennial reign. Uh, so this is another example of a wide timeline, right? Uh, so talking about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit to the millennial reign, uh, there's a long period of time before that happens, uh, but it's all in that one passage, in that one chapter. Uh, and then the third one, Isaiah 9, 24, Joel 2, Zechariah 14. I think all of these are given in your notes uh, and Revelation 20. All of these um, talk about the same uh, um, a set of events about the millennial reign of Christ. And so and we read this as well. Uh, we read all of these passages together to get a better understanding of what that millennial reign will look like. Um, another principle is that a lot of the prophecies have been spiritually fulfilled in the church today. So like if we look at the example from Joel 2, uh, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, uh, Peter talks about this in Acts 2 and he says this has been fulfilled, right? Um, so we see that spiritual fulfillment of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But we also expect that there will be a literal fulfillment of those passages uh, for the nation of Israel as well. So these passages were written as prophecies to the Israelites, right? And the church is the spiritual uh, sees the spiritual fulfillment of these passages. But we also believe that there will be a literal fulfillment of this these exact prophecies for the nation of Israel. Uh, so we'll just look at uh, Amos 9, 11 to 13. If somebody can read that for us, please. Can I read, sister? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Amos 9, 11, 11 to 13. 
on that day i will uh, raise up the tabernacle of david which has fallen down and repair its damages i will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of edom and all the gentiles who are called by my name says the lord who does this thing behold the days are coming says the lord when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed the mountain shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it thank you so uh, here we see this prophecy about david's tabernacle being restored about the gentiles coming to the lord and about um, there being a great harvest uh, verse 13 is talking about a great harvest uh, so if we look at acts 15:15 15, 15, uh, we see here that the church is uh, seeing the fulfillment of this passage, right? The Gentiles uh, are coming to the Lord, and uh, this passage, Acts 15, 15, points back to the same verse uh, in Amos 9. And it says, uh, "Is this is exactly what the prophets had predicted, uh, the conversion of the Gentiles, right? So that is the spiritual fulfillment, but... Uh, we also believe that there will be a little fulfillment where uh, there will be restoration of uh, the worship of uh, temple worship that uh, people will flock to Jerusalem uh, and that there will be a great harvest of uh, souls in that return uh, to worshiping the true God. Uh, so we look at prophecy from both these perspectives, both the spiritual fulfillment in the church and the literal fulfillment for the nation of Israel. Um, we also see uh, dual fulfillment as another aspect of uh, biblical prophecy. So Genesis 3.15, uh, where it talks about uh, the uh, snake and the man always being enemies, right? So there will be a seed uh, from the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. Uh, so there's an immediate um, immediate aspect of fulfillment in that literally um, the way to kill a snake is to crush its head. And that's how snakes are killed uh, by, by us, right? When you're trying to attack a snake, that is the place we attack is the head. Uh, to um, destroy it. But we also know that there was a future implication of Jesus coming as the seed of a woman and crushing the head of Satan. So uh, sometimes there will be prophecies that will have both that immediate literal fulfillment, but also a future uh, perspective that it's pointing to, a future event that it's pointing to. Um, yeah, and the last part is uh, the same thing we talked about, that uh, there are parts of the prophecy that are fulfilled and parts of the prophecies that are still to be fulfilled. So when we are looking at a prophetic passage, um, if if we feel, if we're reading it and we're confused about, um, oh, this is talking about something that has not yet happened, but like the, the example of Joel too, it's talking about, uh, the spirit being poured out, but then it's also talking about the millennial reign of Christ that has not yet happened. Uh, so to recognize that that is very possible in passages, uh, uh, prophetic passages, uh, because they cover huge timelines, because they were written by the prophets um, who just wrote down what they uh, were led to write down without understanding exactly how all of those things would fall into place and at what time. Uh, so this is um, this is pretty much the end of interpreting biblical prophecy. Uh, the intent of this is not to help us go into all of the prophetic passages and now be able to explain everything that we read. Uh, it's just to give us some handle on uh, to give us a basic introduction or give us a handle on how we look at prophetic passages 
to not feel a uh, sense of fear uh, when we're reading passages, to know that there are answers available in scripture uh, if we uh, refer to other passages, other prophetic passages, if we read um, the rest of scripture, um, and to give us some guidelines uh, to help keep us uh, or to guard us as we are interpreting so that we don't go too far away from what the scripture is actually talking about. Um, so any anything that you all would like to say or ask uh, with regard to what we cover? Sister, is there any website where we can look up for the answers we need, like uh, if we have any problem and in interpretation? Um, I, 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 I don't know of any specific websites. Uh, there is a lot of content outside, uh, but I'm not sure of any specific ones. But uh, we do have the second year and third year classes uh, that will cover a lot of this. So if you're planning to stay to your second year and third year, you will uh, look more into biblical prophecy and the end times, uh, Daniel and Revelation. Um, but the other thing is all of our classes are also on YouTube. So um, even if you don't end up staying of, to do your second year or third year for whatever reason, um, those are good resources that you can also reference. OK, sister. Thank you. No problem. OK. Uh, any other questions, or um, should we close and come back uh, for the third hour? Anyone else have anything you want to share? I've, I've just posted on the chat um, what, we, what I had talked about from Daniel 9. So you can look at that. OK, so um, if there are no more questions, then we'll take a break. OK, so we'll come back for our third hour um, in about half an hour. And um, yeah, we'll go into New Testament survey. Thank you all. <laughs>